Open your Bibles, please. The book of Galatians, the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter one, I started here last week and I want to continue. Literally one of the great, great subjects of the Christian faith. So important. No subject I could preach on is more important than this. Did you hear what I just said? What did I just say? Nothing I could preach on would be more important than this because it deals with how to be saved and not the usual one, two, three, four points. It gives you a, a real understanding of salvation, a deep understanding of salvation. It also tells you why so many people are lost because they're very confused about this. They're trying to earn their way to heaven. And so let's read God's word. We're gonna go back and read some of the verses we read last week, but we'll add some more on. And I'll talk to you about the law and the gospel of grace. The law and the gospel of grace. And in Galatians chapter one and verse six, stand with me please, if you will, as we read God's word together. Galatians 1 and 6. I marvel, wrote the Apostle Paul, that you, the Galatian people, are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He said, I marvel that you have made such a change in your doctrinal position, which is not another, but there be some, referring to the Judaizers who had come down and brought dissension in their church. He said, there be some that trouble you and they would pervert the gospel of Christ. So there are people that were attempting to pervert the gospel. And then he says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Now look up here for a minute. You know what he's saying? If one night you wake up and an angel is standing on your foot of your bed and he says that the gospel is something more than that Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again, that's not a true angel. That's a false spirit. If you hear any preacher preach anything and add anything to the gospel of Christ, he's perverting the gospel. You can't hear anything more important in a church in America today than what I've just said. You've got to get the simplicity, the purity, and the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you might have been here for 20 years, but it won't hurt you to hear it, and you'll probably get a deeper understanding. So he repeats himself. Verse 9, as I said before, I say it now again. You see, Paul is, is urgent about this as well as myself. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Do I now seek to persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet pleased men, I would not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. I neither received it of man, nor was I taught it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now go over to chapter two and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified or saved by the works of the law, but by faith, the faith in Jesus Christ, even which we have believed in Christ, that we might be saved or justified or forgiven by the faith in Christ, our faith in Christ, the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Note that last phrase, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Chapter three, verse 11. And that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, 
Cursed is everyone, everyone that hangeth on a tree. That last phrase is important. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree because Christ hung on the tree and he bore the curse. He took the curse for our sins. He took the penalty for our sins. The gospel of grace. You may be seated. So the question often is asked by people, or at least they think about it in their minds. Are Christians under the law? Or are Christians under grace? Or are Christians under both? Is it a mixture of grace and keeping of the law? And nothing could be more important than the answer to that. Now this question was settled, it was answered clearly by Paul here in the book of Galatians and also in the book of Romans over 2,000 years ago now. He answered those questions. But millions of people, unfortunately, are still confused about it. And I will say it's an easy subject to become confused about. And as I spoke last week, false teachers had come down from Jerusalem people who had known the gospel themselves, but had gone back trying to keep the law and the gospel. They were mixing the two together. Paul called these people legalists. We call them legalists today. We call them the Judaizers, meaning they went back to Judaism and mixed it with the Christianity. And their teaching was that faith in the gospel alone and by itself was not sufficient for salvation but that keeping the law of Moses, when I say the law, the law of Moses, was also required if you were going to be saved. And Paul really was dumbfounded by this. Galatians chapter three and verse one. Oh, foolish Galatians, he calls them foolish. Who hath bewitched you or tricked you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth and crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? No. Or by the hearing of faith, belief in the gospel? Obviously, the obvious answer there, of course, is yes. And so Paul, perplexed, how could you become confused so quickly, Galatian church, And he writes this wonderful, wonderful letter to straighten out their confusion, to give answers to them, and to to again proclaim the simplicity of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in order to follow what he's saying here in these chapters, and I'm trying to make it, just break it down and make it as clear as I can, I wanna go back and I want to deal with what they believed about the law or the purposes of the law. Number one, if you're taking notes with me today, the purpose of the law. And to do that, you have to ask yourself, how were people saved before Christ came along? How were people saved originally? How were the people before the law even saved? Have you ever thought about that? Well. Let me tell you, God has only ever had one plan of salvation. Now get that from the message today. God has one plan of salvation. It is by grace, God's unmerited favor and love, by faith. Grace is God's part, faith is your part, my part, that's man's part. So how were people saved before Moses came along and gave the law? Well, let's talk about Noah. And we go to Genesis chapter six and verse number eight, and it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the old song says, and he landed high and dry. (laughs) Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was saved by grace. There wasn't any law. Moses hadn't even been born yet. It would be hundreds of years in the future. Noah was saved by grace through faith. He believed what God told him and prepared for the flood. Let's go to Abraham. A few hundred years later, chapter 15 of Genesis and verse number six. And Abraham, it says about him that he believed God 
And what? It was counted unto him for righteousness. Nothing about the law, nothing about anything that Abraham ever did, his good deeds, his works, anything like that. Abraham was saved the same way you were saved and I am saved, by grace, through faith, not of ourselves, but by the merits of God alone. And then we come to the book of Galatians. And I want to show you a verse we haven't read yet. Go down to verse number 17. This I say that the covenant with Abraham was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years after Abraham, cannot disannul or do away with the grace of God that it might make the promises to Abraham of none effect. So what is it saying? It's saying that the law didn't even come along until 430 years after Abraham. Hundreds more years after Noah. Hundreds more years after Adam and Eve because even they, I believe, were saved by the grace of God. When God killed the animals and took the skins and provided a covering for them, then what was happening? God was imputing grace symbolically upon them. So how were people saved from the creation day up until Moses? They were saved by grace through faith. Now, go with me, if you will, to Galatians chapter 3 and 19. We haven't read that one yet. And I want you to think through it, the verse with me. And in Galatians 3 and 19, wherefore then serveth the law? Okay, he asked the same question I just asked. What is the purpose of the law? Why did God even give the law then if he's, his plan all along has been to, to uh, save people by grace through faith? Wherefore serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, listen, you got to think with me about this. This is not, this is not baby simple, super, I couldn't go down in the preschool and teach this. But you need to know this as an adult today because your salvation really is at stake about an understanding of the gospel. So in Galatians 3 and 19, I see three things there right quick. First of all, it says, number one in that verse, the law was added to something. You see that phrase, it was added? Now the word added means that something existed before that, didn't it? What was it that existed before the law was added? Well, it was grace. It was God's grace, so that's implied there. Then number two, why was it added to grace? Why did God then give the law by Moses and add it to grace? Because of transgressions, or to make it simple, to reveal sin to people. Now, you've got to understand the context of Moses and the children of Israel. And I've been teaching through the wilderness journeys here for oh, a couple, three months now. And you see, Israel had been slaves in Egypt. They came out of Egypt. They're a group of people, illiterate, uneducated, not used to having any uh, anything at all, just servants, just slaves. They were told what to do, when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, what to do. Now, they're gathered out here in the wilderness, and God has one purpose. He's got to shape a nation. He's forming a nation because he's given them the whole promised land. They're going to go in. There are strong enemies in the land, and they've got to be defeated. So God has 40 years now. That's why he kept them out there for 40 years. He's forming a nation. He is turning a million and a half or two million slaves into a powerful, powerful nation that is going to ultimately be the superpower of the ancient world. And so he has to give them a law. They have to have laws. They've been living under Egyptian government. They have to have a civil law where they have the laws of the land. The things you can do and you can't do. Laws about marriage, laws about sanitation, laws about health, all kinds of laws. That's included in the laws of Moses. But it's not got anything to do with salvation. And secondly, God had to give them religious laws. And so he gave them, we call it the ceremonial law. And he, the, the, the sacrifices that they made and the whole temple structure and the priesthood, God gave them all of that. 
because he's forming a nation. This is the religion of this nation. It's going to tie them together. It's still tying the Jewish people together today, years and years and years later. And so God gave them the moral law, the ceremonial law, and he gave them religious laws. He's forming the nation. They have to be strong. And so as he forms that nation, he puts them under these laws temporarily. He gave them the moral law. The moral law, you know, is the Ten Commandments. You find it in Exodus chapter 20. You find it again in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and 6. And so the moral law is the eternal law of God about holiness. But listen to me. It was never intended to save anybody. It was never intended for your salvation. And when you hear a preacher or a teacher or you read in a book or somebody says to you at work, you've got to do this to be saved. Uh-oh, stop. The red flags go up. The law was not given in order to save. It was given to reveal sin. It was given to show you you need Jesus Christ and you can't do it yourself. In fact, nobody here has ever kept the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, perfectly. Not a soul here. Not anybody in the state of South Carolina, America, or the world. Nobody has ever kept perfectly the moral law of God because our sinful nature just won't let us. And so the law was given to reveal sin. Now, listen to me though. Follow with me logically. To re for a transgression or a sin to be a sin, there's got to first be a law. There's got to be a law. When I first moved out to Texas, it was 1968. In 1960, oh, latter part of 67, no, 67. No, wait a minute, 66. I'll get it right in a minute because I got married in 67, so 66, 1966. And I traveled all the time, 100,000 miles a year, and traveled mostly to the west of Fort Worth. Traveled out there in the plains of Oklahoma and West Texas and New Mexico. Country's flat. You couldn't even see a tree in 20, 30 miles. And you know what I was astounded by? There was no speed limits. No speed limits. Boy, from a boy from, for a boy from South Carolina, no speed limit. Mm, pedal to the metal, man, let's go. Out there, they depended at that point in time, I guess, on people's common sense. And the roads were straight, no curves, and you could just go. Now, later on, they put up speed limit signs. And the moment they put up a speed limit sign, we have the law. And if you drive over the speed limit, you're breaking the law. It's like out here, the speed limit's 45. Boy, if I were a, a law enforcement officer, I just sat there and collect fines all day long. There ain't nobody in Florence County drives 45 in front of our church. They're transgressing. They're breaking the law. You've got to have a law because before there can be a transgression, before there can be a sin. And Paul says that over and over. In fact, it'd be worth your while to turn with me to the book of Romans. Turn back to Romans, a couple of books. And he says that over and over. In Romans chapter 3 and verse number 20, he says at the end of the verse, by the law is the knowledge of sin. I wouldn't know that 50 is wrong unless there was a law that I'm to drive 45. Make sense? In Romans chapter 4, verse number 15, where no law is, there is no transgression. There is no sin. Romans 5 and 13, until the law, sin was present in the world, but sin is not imputed or it can't be charged when there's no law. So the speed limit sign means if you go over that, then you have transgressed. But if there were no speed limit signs, as in the 1960s in West Texas, then there's no offense. There's no transgression. Nobody's broken it. It doesn't exist. So the law was given to reveal sin. Up until then, God had not charged sin. 
And so the law was added to grace to reveal to people their need of the grace of God for their forgiveness. And then the third thing here he says in chapter 3 and verse 19, it was added to reveal sin till the seed should come. And who is the seed? Circle that in your Bible. The seed is Jesus Christ, of course. And so the law was given. It was added. It was added to reveal sin, but it had an end to it. The law ended when the seed came, the seed being the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John writes in the first chapter of John, verse 17, the law was given by Moses, but listen, grace and truth came how? By Jesus Christ. Jesus ended the law because Jesus fulfilled the law. He perfectly, the only man who ever could and did, he perfectly fulfilled the moral law. He perfectly fulfilled the ceremonial religious laws of Israel. He perfectly fulfilled the moral law of God. He never broke one of the Ten Commandments of God. And so in fulfilling all of that now, he did that as our substitute. He did that in our place. And the result is you and I are no longer under those laws. Of course, we're under the moral standards of God, his holiness, but not for salvation, never for salvation. I've read you three different verses that said, by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law reveals our need for a savior and our inability to keep the law on our, uh, 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 on our own merits. And so in chapter 3, Galatians again, let me go back and read two of the verses we read to begin with uh, what I've said now as an explanation. And no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Martin Luther's text, Abraham's text, and your text today, my dear friend. Then in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. We're no longer under the curse because the law always brought a curse. We're no longer under the curse of the law because Christ, our substitute, was made a curse for us as he hung on the cross. And so now we are forgiven. We're no longer under that. Isn't that wonderful today? Boy, that's a, I, that ought to deserve a big amen from every heart in this building today. That our salvation is by grace. It always was by grace. And the law was that temporary period given to Israel where they were to obey the ceremonial laws and the civil laws out there in the wilderness and as they established a new country. But it never was given for their salvation or for ours. And you say, well, what about all those sacrifices? They, everybody brought those little lambs and they brought turtle doves and various sacrifices up there to the priest and he would take them and offer them. That's right. You know what he was doing? He, they were putting their faith in that sacrifice temporarily until Christ would come, the promised Messiah, and permanently pay for their sins. And so they had to come every year and bring their Passover lamb. They had to come all the rest of their life Intermittently, they had to come and, uh, and, and present those offerings for their sins. But when Jesus died on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. What do you mean? That law, those sacrifices, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain, it says, from the top to the bottom. God tore open a veil that was three inches thick, three fingers thick, that the women of Israel had woven hundreds of years before. And God, with his invisible hand, ripped that veil open so that now they could look right into the holy of holies where nobody had ever been able to go before. Why? Because all that's null and void and canceled and unnecessary. And so you and I are not bringing a little lamb at Passover. Because we today are trusting in the Lamb of God who came here and died and took our curse, the penalty for our failures. That's salvation 
by grace, through faith, and not of ourselves. And so to summarize again, the law was added to grace to reveal sin until Christ could come and provide permanent salvation. And you and I live at a time after that when salvation by grace is all we've ever known, but don't take it for granted. It's so wonderful. Not one soul was ever saved during that period of time by trying to keep the law. Not one soul was saved from creation to Christ. Nobody there was ever able to maintain their salvation after they had it by keeping the law. Only Jesus Christ, faith in him and his love and grace gives us a permanent remedy for our sins and gives us salvation. So then let me define now. We're, with that understanding, we're ready to define what is legalism. Because legalists are still around, by the way. They didn't come down from, Judea, from Jerusalem, and they're not telling us today that we've got to mix Judaism and Christianity and keep the ordinances of the Jewish faith. But they're still legalists. Because let me give you a definition of legalism. Legalism is the mixing of law and grace. It's the mixing of law and grace. It is adding something to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we can't add anything to it because it's a finished work. Jesus has already finished it. Jesus warned against legalism in Matthew chapter 16, if you're taking notes with me, he referred to it as the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven or the doctrine of the Pharisees. And he warned his disciples and the people that day about it. They, you see, what was the leaven of the Pharisees, the doctrine of the, of, of the Pharisees? It was pure legalism. What they had done is they took the law of Moses. Now, if you studied the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the book of Genesis, add, add that to it. The, the, the Torah, the Jewish people call it. If you took the Torah and went through it and minutely marked every single law, there are 16, uh, 613 laws in the Torah. 613 commands, 613 requirements that a Jew living in the land of Israel at that time had to keep in order to fulfill the law. That's why nobody could. 613 laws in the Torah. But the Pharisees came along, and this is true of legalists today. They're never satisfied. It's never enough. You can't ever do enough. And so they came along, and they added more requirements to the 613 laws. And that's the way of legalism. When do you ever achieve enough to please God? And you could never know. And I know good people in churches and they love the Lord and, and they believe the Bible. And, and yet they have this uncertainty. They have this insecurity inside them. They're always striving and trying. When have I ever done enough? How much, how much do I need to give to feel good about it? How much do I need to serve? How much do I need to read my Bible? How much did I pray? And before long, they're just in turmoil inside. I haven't done enough. When do I know if I've ever done enough? And so legalism is, is a poison. And the modern legalists come along and they add human effort to the gospel for salvation. And I don't want to call the names of churches and denominations and so on because I, I, you'd miss my point. But in effect, when people add anything to salvation, they're saying what Jesus did at the cross was not sufficient. That's the, that's the logic of legalism. The logic of legalism, you got to do more. What Jesus did when he hung on the cross was insufficient to take you to heaven when you die. You got to do something on your own. You got to add to the work of Christ on the cross. And so they add all kinds of stuff. You got to believe the gospel, plus, you got to be baptized. You got to take communion. 
You got to keep the Sabbath. There are dietary regulations in some religions. There are lifestyle issues, how you dress, where you go, what you do. Now, some of those things Christians need to be careful of, but they don't save you. They don't save you. There's no salvation in anything that you can do. Sometimes we impose a very strict moral code and people call that legalism. That's not legalism. For example, we get accused of being legalists because we have some dress requirements for our kids in school. Well, we don't have them to help them get saved. We have them because we're trying to teach them how to live in life. Not to come looking like a freak when you appear for a job interview. But that has nothing to do with their salvation. It has to do with common sense. It has to do with living a life that a good representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're not legalists. We don't add anything to salvation. Man, I'm pounding a hole in the pulpit up here trying to say that to you today. It's salvation by grace through faith. Don't add anything to it. Don't listen to anybody who adds anything to it. If they've got another book in addition to the Bible, don't listen to them. That's legalism. Human effort, sometimes they tell us also legalism. So we, now you're saved by grace, but you gotta do this to keep your salvation. Be wary when people tell you that you can lose your salvation by something you can do or have done or whatever, because what they're saying again is what Jesus did not do and what Jesus did at the cross is insufficient to keep you saved after you are saved. We sing the old song, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Does that fountain still exist or did it just run down from the cross and go into the dirt? No, it still exists. If you read the book of heaven, uh, the book of Hebrews, I personally believe that fountain is still existing in heaven today and it's sufficient. And the Lord God looks at that fountain of his son's precious blood and he can look at me, and if I've received Jesus as my Savior, he says that fountain covered his sins. So I got a little chart. I want to wrap this up. I haven't preached in years, and you can tell I get excited about this. Y'all are knocking me over with your enthusiasm, but uh, I, I don't need your enthusiasm to make me preach on this. I got my own inside. I, promise you that so um, little charm the law prohibits grace invites and gives the law condemns the sinner grace redeems the sinner the law says do grace said it's done the law says try to be holy grace says it's finished the law says the law curses, but grace blesses. The law brings death, but grace brings life. The law condemns the best man who ever lived, but grace saves the worst man who ever lived. The law says, pay what you owe. Grace says, you're forgiven. The law says, the soul that sins, it shall die. Grace says, believe the gospel and live. The law reveals sin. Grace, though, provides an atonement for sin. The law demands obedience. Grace gives power and then the desire to obey God. Boy, that one is so important. Grace gives power and desire to obey. And number 12, the law produces bondage, but grace produces liberty. And so Paul, Paul's gospel, we call it the gospel of grace, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go back to your text in Galatians chapter one for just a moment, and let me show you a third point. Number one was the purpose of the law. Number two is legalism is the mixing of the law and grace. And point number three is a look at the gospel of grace alone. Look in verse 11. 
I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. I didn't get it from somebody. Nobody taught me this. I did not read it in a book. I neither received it of man, nor was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ actually taught the Apostle Paul personally the gospel of grace. It was revealed to him. Go down to verse number 17. He said, I didn't go up to Jerusalem and talk to the other disciples, but I went to Arabia, Saudi Arabia, the desert, and I spent three years there in verse number 18, he said. And before I returned up to Damascus where I was saved and where I knew some Christians, he said, I spent three years by myself in the desert, the Holy Spirit of God teaching me the intricacies and the details of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the rest of the disciples were Jews, and they were ministering to the Jewish people, but Paul was the, what, the apostle to the Gentiles. And so the gospel, number one, was supernatural in its origin. He didn't get it from anybody else. God gave it to him personally. Number two, the gospel glorifies God, not man. Look in verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. And verse number 24, and they glorified God in me. And so the gospel glorifies God. Now look, think with me. Look up here for a minute. If I did anything to add to or to contribute to my salvation, it would glorify me. You'd say, oh, that's a good man. What a good man. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about what Jesus did, and it glorifies Jesus. And no man gets any glory for the gospel of Christ. It's all about him. Don't ever forget that. By grace, you're saved through faith. Why? So we won't boast, Ephesians said. Then how do we glorify God? Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. How do you as an individual, you're not a preacher, you're not a missionary, you're not, this is not, not even the same calling on your life as on mine, I presume. So you say, how do I glorify God? By believing his gospel. By believing the gospel, you take all the credit from yourself and you lift it up and put it in the hands of Jesus Christ who loved you and who died for you. And he is glorified. Every Christian has the capacity to do that. And look with me lastly in verse 13. The gospel has supernatural power. He said, you heard of my lifestyle, my conversation in the past, in the Jews, in the Jews' religion, how I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. And in verse number 23, after I was saved, they heard this, that he which had persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And Paul was the greatest enemy of Christ that probably ever had been. He hated Jesus Christ. He hated Christians. He persecuted them. And suddenly, on the road to Damascus, he is a changed man, changed by the power of God, the same power that can change you today. Every true conversion is a miracle. It's a miracle of transformation. Rarely do I ever appeal to a video or a clip because I think a preacher ought to be able to explain the Word of God without any help from that. But I saw something on YouTube that touched my heart. It's the single greatest illustration of what I would call the power of God to change people that I've seen in a long time. I want you to watch it. It only lasts about two minutes, and we'll close. I was standing in front of their, um, like the head of that detention center, and he said, um, what is your faith? If you say you're Muslim, you can go out this door right now. If you say you're Christian, you're going to be tortured, you're going to be raped, and you're going to die. I opened my mouth and I said, I'm Christian. And 
and that guy was shocked that I said that. And he said, tell me your testimony. That's going to be your, against you for your case. It, it, because in Iran, being a Christian carries the death penalty or long-term imprisonment. So I shared my testimony, and this man at the end of that whole ordeal ended up crying and asking for the Bible. The power of God in the gospel. Share your testimony. And I, what you say is going to be used against you in Iran. She's Iranian. And she went ahead and shared the gospel. And the judge is weeping. Give me a Bible, he says. Only the power of the Holy Ghost can do that in a person's life. And that same power is yours and mine today. Amen and amen. Bow your head with me if you will, please.